Hello and welcome to the special edition of Outlook Portion. Today we are going to discuss trans fatty acids, which not many people know about, but which is present in many of the savouries, cakes, biscuits, and jalebis and samosas that all of us eat. We have with us as a special guest today, Dr. Rajan Shankar, Director of Nutrition of Tata Trusts. Thank you so much for being here with us, sir. And I look forward to a really interesting conversation with you on this. Dr. Sankar has uh, been a clinical physician for a long time, for I think three decades. And he was in the army. I think he served in Sikkim. And that was where he first got, got interested in nutrition. And since then, he has, uh, I mean, worked on nutrition for a long time. So if anybody can tell us about trans fat and how it works, yeah, I think Dr. Shankar is the right person to come to. Thank you so much, Dr. Shankar, for coming with us. Dr. Shankar, let's first start with a question that says, like, you know, when did the world and India wake up to the perils of trans fat? Yeah, well, I think in the mid-60s, we, um, the world started realizing the perils of fat in general, and particularly saturated fat and that relationship to cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. That is when, with the, uh, the world is looking for alternate ways to use fat, of course, the way of artificially, industrially making trans fat had started much earlier in the century. And then there is also the time when people started depending more and more on markets for their food needs. So it's a combination of factors together that made the use of industrially made trans fat more and more into the food system. That is as our dependence on, uh, you know, the um, processed food increase and dependence on the markets for food increase. And there mm -hmm. is a time there is also a kind of an advice on reducing saturated fats, people move into this. So all this somewhere increased our uh, intake of uh, trans fats. And in the mm -hmm. next two, three decades, we started realizing the relationship between uh, increased intake of trans fat and cardiovascular morbidity mortality. It mm -hmm. came to light in the 90s, but then by about end of the 90s, the evidence was uh, quite clear that there is a clear link between uh, trans fatty acids and the bad cholesterol, or to put it short, the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Okay, that, that's interesting, sir, because, you know, uh, I was reading somewhere that, uh, you know, uh, the product we have called Dalda, which it actually came uh, here from the Dutch, who had bought uh, right. fatty acid here, and then it's quite a, I mean, interesting history to it. But, sir, you know, India has pledged to cap trans fatty acids in our food to a safe level before the WHO deadline of 2023. I think WHO wants to uh, ban trans fats globally by 2023. But the regulations that we have so far are still drafts and have not yet been notified. So what do you think, what are the immediate steps that we need to take to make sort of, you know, trans fat free India by... Yeah, you said about the history of, uh, you know, the dalda or hydrogenated oil, as we call it, uh, entering into India. But I think we should also be aware that, um, you know, at any given point, in, in hindsight, we are so much wiser. In fact, this mm -hmm. was introduced in India as a poor man's deed. And right. the government went on and took the right step to even add vitamin A to it thinking that, uh, you know, so people depend on this hydrogenated oil and their intake of animal fat is low and therefore they will be deficient in white mm -hmm. But then, as we have learned about the ill effects of uh, trans fatty acids, the government has also moved and they've done their bit. They, in 2013, they brought in a regulation to cap the limit to 5% to 10%. And then I think it's around 2016, 17, it was brought down further down to 5%. But then the use of this is so 
extensive as uh -huh. you said in your introduction in our uh, savories and very sweets and uh, you know in many forms of uh, you know bakery products and many processed food it mm -hmm. takes time to completely eliminate it the government mm -hmm. has put the uh, draft notification i think but it takes time it requires uh, talking to the industry partners getting our uh, you know regulatory system up to date you need you know capacity building you need the uh, laboratories with you know right equipment to even test it when we move but we have right. made a bold decision to say that we will beat this deadline a year ahead and there have been series of meetings with the industry with the academia um, on moving but i don't know why what is really delaying this regulation being firmed up and the uh, draft notification I don't mm -hmm. know the answer. That's we need to do it if we want to catch the deadline. We must do that's it right. as early as possible. And that's right. there is no reason why we are not doing it. We should do it. There is WHO mm -hmm. has recommended it. More than thirty countries in the world have done it, and right. we have been moving in that path. And you know, whatever be the roadblock, we must do our best to eliminate that so that we fulfil our commitment. And uh, eliminate this in 2022. So the uh, uh, FSSAI, which sort of handles food and safety in, in uh, our, our country, they have put out two draft regulations. One which calls for a two percent limit on fats and oils, and the other for a similar cap on foods, in which mm. edible oils and fats are used as an ingredient. while these regulations are sort of almost comprehensive if put together there are still i think loopholes because if if there are foods which have trans fat mm. begin they might get stay out of the loop now what how do we address those i mean is, is the way in which you or i or somebody could actually go to the fssai and say that look you know you have a gap here or how, how is that how do those loopholes get plugged i think it's good that you pointed this out uh, i'm i i don't know the reasons ideally it should be just one having uh -huh. this kind of uh, two um, you know uh, levels and uh, it it could create confusion and as you said it could be a loophole that uh, people might use to beat the system i don't know the reason why if it says it is done it there must be some solid but i agree with you and i think that they should take a look at it and try and see that it's just one comprehensive regulation so that that makes sense in in many ways but you know um, perhaps perhaps there is a way in which somebody could actually point it out to fssi that this is what should be done or i'm sure many ngos have already done that we don't know their stand you know why fsai ai you see it's it's uh, doing their best to make the food wholesome for the population i mean they mm -hmm. moved away from the pfa days where it was a kind of a penal action it was the only thing that the prevention of food adulteration act took but fsai ai in the last uh, decade the kind of work that they have done is to make food wholesome and they work with the industry with academia with the general public and so if they have done this we 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 have to hear what is their point of view and there are uh, you know technical committees that head every one of the regulation that come out you know the i do not know the reason but i think the point that you make out sounds very uh, logical so i'm sure if it is projected their expert committees uh, and the regulatory authorities will take a very uh, you know the yes, right sir, sure view and give an answer i am i'm not representing them but i am no, as much interested in you in that but from well, only thing is having been um, closely associated working on the salt iodization on mm -hmm. various food fortification regulations i am of the a firm believer that 
you know, this has been one of the fantastic transformations in food regulation that has happened in the country. And so mm -hmm. there are, it's not done by a few bureaucrats, it's done by all technical people sitting in various committees. So I do not know what is the reason why they have kept this too, and we should try to find out. I think they must have done due diligence and arrived at this type of thing. It's not some random decision that they must have taken. Mm. But so there's another angle to this whole thing that, you know, given this pandemic and people diverting their resources and everything to, uh, you know, to tackle the pandemic, do you think that there is a possibility that, you know, food safety and, and, and TFA could be sort of put on the back burner until things get sorted out and that could be used to sort of, you know, uh, delay the deadline? Not used, but that, that could be a reason for us yeah. to sort of... See, the priorities have changed. Many places, uh, you know, uh, it, it's uh, hopefully it will move back and uh, uh, they're able to take stock. And also for several reasons, you know, the uh, a lot of people we've seen about the plight of migrant workers. The people are pushed into difficult situation because of job loss and things. So they're going to look for cheap food. Many of them are going to depend more on what is available in the market. And mm -hmm. cheap food, low cost ones, processed ones are all going to depend more and more on trans fat. So there is a danger that not only that the regulatory authorities let go because of other uh, compelling uh, priorities, as well as the industry sees this as an opportunity to fulfill the demand. So I think it's a very fair point. We need to keep this uh, goal of achieving this, what we have promised in time. So uh, there should be a group that starts working and putting pressure on the Ministry of Health and Food and Food Safety and Standards Authority to, um, you know, focus on this. But sir, there's another uh, aspect to this whole thing, which, you know, has also intrigued me for, for a while, ever since I started sort of, you know, trying to understand what trans fat is all about, that it is used in a lot of our foods, in, you know, starting from the street food that we get, which is deep fried to, like you said, pastries and cakes and all kinds and processed foods and things. So could the reason be that, that, that there is no really viable alternative which, which can be used instead of that? Because I understand, my understanding is the reason trans fat is used is because it gives food a slightly longer shelf life, let's say pastries and things. You know, uh, that, that's my fundamental understanding of why trans fat is so popular in, in trans fatty oils. As well as really, really have a, you know, viable, economically, you know, viable alternative for it. The very fact that uh, 30 countries have done it and many more on way to doing it by 2022. Mm -hmm. And the World Health Organization, very strongly supporting this move, are all indications that this is something which is both achievable and desirable. Now, uh, I'm sure that there are alternatives, and they've even given details of, you know, how it can be done enzymatically, how you can make it chemically, how you can. There are multiple ways by which you're doing it. And the simplest mm -hmm. thing, as I understand, is that uh, even blending of oils is uh, a good alternative. Uh, oh, okay. okay. I won't go into the technical details, I'm not an expert, but it is uh, definitely possible and it can be done and it has been done. Mm -hmm. uh, there are alternatives available. Right, sir. But, but sir, you know, uh, trans fatty acids, I, from my understanding, is quite a, you know, it, it is a harbinger of a lot of deadly non communicable diseases, as you said, cardiovascular disease and a lot of other diseases which can be triggered off by this oils. But it is still not in the mainstream discussion of, you know, people who look at nutrition. Why do you think that is the that is the thing? I mean, you and I are talking about it, but I don't really see it in the media as, as much. Is, do you think there's a reason for that? Yeah, yeah. I think you know, even non-communicable diseases as a whole 
is not uh, still being viewed as a problem of nutrition as today. See, for nutrition, the country with uh, which has been continuing to struggle with undernutrition, uh, our focus has always been on you know hunger, uh, undernutrition, and now it has definitely shifted. See, nutrition has three dimensions. One is you eat less, and that's what you have under nutrition. What results we normally refer to stunting, wasting, and underweight. Then the other dimension is where you eat more than what is required for the, the bodily function, and you end up with overweight obesity. And then what straddles both this form is vitamin and mineral deficiency, which happens in both undernutrition as well as in overnutrition. Now, we continue to have a massive problem with undernutrition, but we've also started having problem with overnutrition and overweight. It's not anymore in the future. There is what mm -hmm. we call as double burden. Absolutely. And this double burden of a country's having both undernutrition and overnutrition at the same time is mm -hmm. what countries like India are facing. And overnutrition and obesity and their link to non-communicable diseases is well established. What we don't really uh, make it very widely known is the fact that people, children who are undernourished in childhood or born low birth weight or born small and rapidly gain weight after birth in the first two years are more prone to non-communicable diseases later in life. Mm -hmm. There are many epidemiological uh, studies that show this clear linkage. That is because children, if, to oversimplify a very complex uh, phenomenon, mm -hmm. children who are growing, say the fetus growing in the mother's womb, when it is uh, subjected to scarcity, that fetus is programmed to live in scarcity. And when they postnatally, after birth, if they're exposed to excess, they're not able to handle it. That's why they develop overweight obesity. So all oh. this has a linkage. And we know not only overweight and obesity, they also develop what is called a metabolic syndrome. That is, they cannot handle excess of sugar and fat. And that is why they develop the uh, cardiovascular or you know the non-communicable diseases the diabetes epidemic that we see in India is probably in some form is also the undernutrition in uh, while growing in the mother's womb or early childhood all that is also contributing to the diabetes and the metabolic syndromes that we see so the mm -hmm. linkage definitely is not clearly known and we need to uh, Literally, you know, the, the Ministry of Health and others have to make it more widely known to the people so that uh, people are aware and start taking uh, appropriate action. Regulation is one. We may bring regulations on trans fat and bring mm. other things, but the public support based on clear understanding of why it is being done would be necessary. Without that regulation alone, we won't be able to now that's an interesting point. You know, I, I'd like to sort of, you know, uh, uh, end this interview with that last question. In fact, what you just mentioned, that um, how how does the government really push this understanding down to the masses? Because I can understand labeling, which would be probably important for an urban milieu. That okay, this is dangerous because it has trans fat, etc. But how does the government sort of educate the rural people and the people? Let's say the guy who's you know, frying your samosa in the corner, street corner, or selling it in some rural area. How do you explain to him about the perils of trans fat? How does the government do that? Or do you think it's a, it's not a government job and it's the NGOs and others should do it? No, no it, it certainly is a government job, you know. Uh, could help is, a, help is a merit good in the sense that when the benefits of an intervention accrue not just to an individual, but to the population as a whole, every mm -hmm. sovereign government has 
a role and a duty to do that. So if mm-hmm. you can save lives and if you can prevent uh, illness and uh, make people more productive, it government has to take the lead and do it. The Ministry of Health and so you know the central government and all state governments have uh, the wherewithal to take it and do. They have communication divisions. They have huge resources available for. advertising through all forms of mediums and uh, it it's a question of taking this as a priority and doing it they uh, anywhere where the government has decided uh, it's a priority and that campaign has become visible and it has reached the masses and uh, so it's about taking it as a priority allotting it its due place there are competing priorities that this is also important and the government can do it and they have the where without to do it oh, okay that that's the thing and, and but you're saying that if, if the if ngos and the other non governmental organizations also get into the act that would be sort of a force multiplier definitely definitely they you see in health matters in most of the rural population it's my personal opinion uh for all the mistrust of the government that you know the urban uh, elite uh, harbors when it comes to health people are ready to take what the government says you know we still have the trust that the governments would announce or make say something that is generally good for the population so when the government launches a campaign on uh, say the healthy uh, diet Healthy eating, uh, like uh, you know, FSSA comes and says, "Eat right, India movement." Those things it can be picked up from there by NGOs, the community-based organizations, mm-hmm. and others uh, who run uh, campaigns. For example, you people have taken it from your own uh, media group, Outlook, to talk about portion, to talk about uh, you know how to fight this uh, war on. Uh, nutrition, so that that way others can pick up and add and become force multipliers. But the primary role I still feel need to be in government. The way we are structured with such huge rural population and most dependent on the government for very many services. Okay, okay, uh, Shankar, we we seem to be sort of running out of time, so we will close it with that. and uh, i'd like to thank you so very much for putting this whole you know thing into perspective because i don't think anybody could have done it as lucidly as you just did so thank you so very much sir that was thank you thank you very Dr. much ram uh, thank you for inviting me thank you for talking to us about the perils and the problems of trans fatty acids thank you again sir and i look forward to having you with us again thank, thank you. you thank you very much